hand over to the chair of this session, Victor Chude. Victor is Professor of Soil Science. He is President of the Soil Science Society of Nigeria. Um, he um, is uh, very engaged in um, uh, developing Nigeria's agricultural productivity uh, related to um, appropriate use of uh, nutrients, fertilizer, and so on. Um, he stays close to uh, policy and the action. Uh, Victor, I hand over a fascinating set of panelists to you. Uh, the purpose of this session, dear colleagues, is to learn from early experiences, from case studies, um, from studies at country level and below, for the ELD initiative. So we don't start from zero, from scratch. There is already <coughs> lots of good experience. Victor, they are yours. Colleagues, um, thank you. Uh, we are behind schedule, but uh, take your time. Uh, seven minutes, no more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to appreciate uh, Joaquin and Korea for making it possible for me to be at uh, this uh, forum. I, <clears throat> I come from a country where <clears throat> land degradation is a serious problem. Desertification in another part of the country is moving at a rate of 0 0.6 kilometers per year. In the southern part of the country, particularly in the east, southeast, Erosion is such a terrible uh, phenomenon to the extent that some states are about being declared, state of emergency is about being declared in some of the states. That tells you how serious <coughs> land degradation is. Then there are some other areas in the northern part where you have a lot of salinization. And then again, some parts of the East have serious problems with acidity. So, my government is investing a lot to redress the problem. So all the issues being discussed here are of interest to Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll listen to theories, definitions and all that. Now we are going to listen to real life experiences on how to redress the problem. Let me start by introducing our first speaker, Professor Pavel Krashilikov, the head of the department, Land Resources, Eurasian Center for Food Security. Moscow State University of Russia graduated from that same university, the Department of Soil Science in 1982. He worked in the Institute of Biology at the Karelian Scientific Center from 1993 to 2011. He is currently a member of the Jura Boards of So Many Journals. Ladies and gentlemen, may we invite our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor. Oh, perfect. Uh, I'm awfully sorry because uh, my speech will not uh, uh, deal with our uh, successful, successful experience in, in soil management. Uh, it was initially uh, planned for as uh, more theoric exercise in searching for a strategy for competing land degradation in Central Asia. The thing that uh, was speaking about land degradation and economy, the thing that as a soil scientist, I'm also a simple soil scientist, as many of you, well, uh, uh, for soil scientists, mm, it is very natural to wish that all the soil should be well conserved and reclaimed but in fact, we are governed to a great extent by policy and economy, by the strategy, uh, strategy that was selected not by ourselves, but by the, well, 
politicians, by governments, or just by fate. Okay. Uh, first, I have to introduce our center. Uh, uh, Eurasian Center for Food Security was founded as a response to Russian Federation uh, to the Lakila Food Security Initiative. Uh, the focal area is Central Asia and some part of South Caucasus. And our activities are mainly uh, <coughs> education, research in agricultural economy and soil science, land management, uh, and also <coughs> expertise. Also expertise. Okay, uh, you know, uh, you already saw this map. Uh, it's a focal region, uh, especially these three countries are of major importance for us, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Well, Kazakhstan is a rich country and Turkmenistan is very close. Uh, and these three countries have a set of uh, very important uh, problems related to land degradation. And what is our role? In fact, uh, it is a very delicate issue because well, there are independent countries and we cannot teach them how to behave, of course. That's the first point. But uh, our uh, small support and assistance we can give in the area of research and education would definitely depend on the strategic decisions taken by the governments and politicians of these countries. And I'll try to show in a small example how our our strategy completely depends on the strategy, on some focal decisions made by these countries. Well, the main degradation issues are soil and salinization, organic carbon loss, and decreasing water quality. A set of uh, degradation phenomena related to desertification. And what is the reason the lack of water? Okay, and there are some conflicts, so conflicts of interests, because always there are some conflicts when you have some resources, but there are always not enough to reach all the purposes. First, of course, it's water used for irrigation versus hydroelectric power. Of course, uh, you can say it's enough water for both of them, but they have completely different time schedules. You need more energy in winter and you need irrigation water in summer. And it's a strong conflict, both political and technical problem uh, between to select for irrigation or hydroelectric power. What I use for salt washing? For uh, land uh, reclaiming, reclaiming land and what I use for irrigation. There are two different purposes. You cannot use water for both of them. There is not enough water. What they use for irrigation or the maintenance of the Aral Sea. The development of secondary salinization in Aralku, in the desert that already exists in the place of Aral Sea, uh, versus the perspectives for petroleum production that is very promising exactly at the bottom of this sea. The need for long term investment in soil quality and the search for quick refund. There are also very, very different things, and we cannot reach both of them. Manpower-oriented agricultural production in the countries, and unfortunately, a higher rate of migration of human resources. The thing is that the migration of human resources, to some extent, is a positive element for the economy, because an income uh, with the money earned by these people is very high, but on the other hand, there is nobody to work in some places in agriculture. And there are some important decisions one should take. Uh, first, the ROC to be or not to be. It's not just a, it, it's not an easy question, because of course uh, all the environment and, uh, environmental scientists will say, of course, we should maintain the ROC, uh, but if you maintain the RLC, you can do many other things. Cotton, an absolute priority of negotiable. Electric power plants, if there are prospects for compromise. Investments, who is ready to put up capital and how much? There are several basic questions we should answer. And depending on the answer to these questions, 
the strategy for land reclamation completely changes. For example, we can abandon ROC and have a positive scenario for the development of the region. Complete water use for irrigation and washing. No RLC, no need for water there. And the use of water can be more complete. Well, it's enough to maintain or increase even cotton production. But there is a need for regulation of water supply. And the need for investment in land reclamation is one of the economic, macroeconomic scenarios for the region. And in this case, our assistance should be aimed at improving land. And if we want to maintain the RLC, well, forget it. There is a strong reduction in irrigation agriculture, especially in cotton production. Why not? Well, one can think about other strategies for the development of the countries, well, industrial, post-industrial states, why not? Hmm? Need for the development of alternative land use strategies then we have to develop another type of suggestions for these people. And there is a need for investment in social stability, education and training to develop a new type of uh, society. And in this case, there is no conflict between the electric power station and uh, uh, the use of water. Because to maintain the ROC, you need water in winter when it doesn't evaporate. Okay, then the key decisions should be taken by the governments and the leaders of these countries. And our strategy would depend completely on these uh, crucial decisions. And that's why I think uh, what, what kind of a lesson we have here is that, uh, of course, as soil scientists, we would prefer to maintain that to maintain the sea, to maintain an agricultural production, and to increase the well-being of the people. But we cannot win everything. Win-win-win strategy is a myth. We're living in the real world, unfortunately. <laughs> then we have to select and we have to adapt our strategies to the policy of the regional policy. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. One thing is very clear. You can't just walk into a country to impose your ideas on them. For you to be successful, you have to take into consideration the policy, the interest of the country. And make sure that what your intervention must be in line with the interest of the country. Otherwise, you don't get that uh, government commitment. So thank you. May I invite the next speaker, Alim Latov, who is a professor, graduated from Tuscan Institute of Irrigation and Amelioration. That was in 1984. He then worked in various positions in the same institute as a deputy dean at the Faculty of Engineering. Engineering. He headed the research department for a pretty long time, director of Center for International Relations and Training for about two years, served as a vice rector for the International Affairs and Training. Currently, <coughs> he, is, he leads the EcoGIS Center, established with him in partnership with Waganagin University in the Netherlands. So, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like, to, first of all, to uh, thank you, uh, Jochen van Brandt, for the invitation. It was a uh, pleasure to, sorry that for we'll delay with the answer, but we have uh, done and then we came here. Uh, thank you for also the, for Anishet, he's always supporting. After you, this, uh, the, uh, my presence here. And uh, I would like to uh, start with this small experience, which is we gained in Uzbekistan. And especially, uh, I will talk about the, how the um, expertise may be in on conservation agriculture and plus the new development on the 
when degradation assessment is approved, uh, remote sensing and GIS. As especially I uh, looked at the issue paper, which is mainly focused on also the, how to bring this to for economic, economic value assessment as also GIS and remote sensing uh, tools, which is very powerful and then uh, probably we will be used much in the future. Um, I'm also not economics guy. I'm ag engineer by background, but my life put me more in the soil in the dirty because we started to think about the ecology environment, <coughs> and we started to, before to put machinery to the field. We start to think about the soil, and uh, well, most of our graduates now in the soil science. Uh, now is becoming economics also, and uh, different aspects of. Uh, ecology or environment. I will also thank you for Pavel because he saved my some time, which is the also introduced to Uzbekistan and RLC. And I know talk will be uh, my talk not will be about RLC, uh, even though we do we done the conservation agriculture in a RLC basin. Uh, I'll talk about more uh, soil degradation, and especially uh, uh, my also. I'm also represented as a CASCAT, is a, a, a consortium of agricultural university for Central Asia and South Caucasus, eight countries. But Uzbekistan is a, one of the, this CASCAT uh, partner, and uh, the several universities from our country participate in this consortium. Uh, Uzbekistan is uh, located in Central Asia for those who just uh, quick to understand where we are, and maybe Pavel already showed about 30 million population area about 45, about around 45 million hectares and divided on the several uh, 12 regions. The main issues uh, in, uh, in the land, land degradation, I would stop on the uh, soil salinization, especially the secondary salinization. And if you read some data paper which is produced by World Bank and ADB and etc. Uh, international organization which is there counted that, that uh, during the last 10 years we have about uh, half a million uh, uh, increase of saline soil. What does it mean? Is that yearly we have a 50,000 soil which has been degraded by uh, salinization. Water logging trends also de decreased, uh, increasing the 33 percent from 1.9 million to the up to the 2.5 million hectares. Also, at the same time, we have uh, uh, about the 53 percent of our total land is about 4 million hectares, which is we used for irrigation. And 4 million hectares is give us 90, 95% of the agricultural output. And the, all the other 50% of our soil is just only bring the uh, rest of the 5%. And this, uh, from 4 million hectares, we have 53 million, 53% uh, which is the, under the saline, and 47% from, uh, from it, it's a moderate and high salinization. Soil erosion. And especially sal saline soil need to extra water for leaching or washing and it's up to the 20% more than we use for the normal uh, soil. Land degradation also under the soil erosion about uh, 600,000 uh, hectares and as uh, by estimation of the World Bank that uh, economic losses from the uh, from the land the, the degradation or salinity about 30, uh, 31 million uh, dollars US dollars and it's the, uh, the economic losses due to agricultural land taken out of use is about 12 million dollars. Conservation agriculture. In this uh, week, we will be talking a lot in different sessions about conservation agriculture, but I would like to just put some, uh, uh, some materials, information, experience, which is we started in earlier uh, 89, 90s, especially with small steps and uh, Professor Latan Lal is visited us in the 2002 when we established a full conference first step to uh, bring the awareness in Uzbekistan about this conservation agriculture steps and especially minimum soil disturbance, uh, soil, the soil crop residue retention and crop rotation and diversity as the three main key per, per, uh, principles for conservation agriculture. I will put just only this quick uh, introduce this, all the steps which is we passed through from 89 and I don't want to even read because this is too, too much and then only seven minutes given to for me 
I will just only say that a lot of the funds, I mean small funds, but it's uh, different organizations came to Uzbekistan and uh, support us with this, all the, this, uh, uh, the, the, the theories, uh, New Zealand organization, FO, uh, US, I, Iowa State University, Ohio State University, and still going on, uh, ADB, Haselim organized, Jirkas, Japan. And I'm very happy that the last year we received support from our government. Oh, what does it mean? It means that the government also come to the point that it's necessary. I very like this, this uh, the last grant, even the small grant, but the government guy. Right? The some results uh, started from 2002, 2003, 2006, uh, especially with the ZEV project, which has uh, put a huge resources in the uh, near the RLC basin, is the horizon. And we, we started jointly together uh, with, uh, with the ZEV Bonn University, and we have very good results, and especially for the humus <coughs> organic matter. Uh, which as you can see the, from the first slide. We had also the show that that's, uh, salinity decreasing after the several years. We also show that the soil moisture in the Sertaria, not in Harezen, in Sertaria recently in 2010-2011, we also reached uh, some uh, 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 soil moisture retention in the irrigated land. And erosion also, erosion also uh, declined. The most important also that some of our PhD students and master students working on the soil biology and especially earthworms, they show that this picture there's the uh, how difference uh, in the different plots, in experiment plots, uh, the number of the uh, earthworms increasing from the <coughs> 10, 10 centimeter layer and decreasing by that. But the, uh, if you uh, if you see uh, on the control plot it's zero. If you go to the field, you cannot find the one spitter meter any at all. So this the we are losing the <coughs> biodiversity, even the biology of soil, the almost soil death. And also the microorganisms, which is also showing that in our the plot, which is under the conservation agriculture with the crop residue, so we have a, a much more diversity of the a new microorganism which is coming up. Also economics. It, uh, this uh, I will say the sustainable development of agriculture. This is good, like Pavel said, win to win uh, for farmers and uh, for technologists. First of all, the farmers really like because it's a very low, little input, and secondly, he had a good, uh, the same at least the same uh, the level of the yield. Then soil assessment. The other students, uh, together with Wagen University, as you mentioned. Uh, under the double degree master program, also the PhD, done several researches about assessment of salinity in the outer land. Uh, how to do it? Because it's not very easy uh, with the remote sensing to catch the soil. And through different ways, through the uh, NDVI uh, correlation with the, uh, the saline areas, we measured. I don't want to stop on this, this, this dissertation, just only show a few examples about what we've uh, done. There's also the PhD. Uh, work of the Akmal Akramkhanov, also done in PhD in Bonn uh, University, he also showing that uh, before the leaching, uh, what kind of the uh, uh, salinity we have after leaching, decreasing, and also the after in August. In August, when we have the, uh, less water, we don't have irrigation, and then much salinity arising up again. Up. In the third cases, we have uh, about groundwater, shallow water. Uh, how this the, the water table is about one and one and a half meter, and modern consolidated ground water is about about two grams per liter. And you can see the in also in the March, also during irrigation we have uh, uh, we have uh, the less ground water, and also the in in in, in October when we have uh, deeper the layer of the, the uh, uh, ground water. And in conclusion. I would like to say that the conservation agriculture is uh, on irrigated, in an irrigated area. I'm not talking about dry land area because dry land area is much easier. And we have now the examples in Kazakhstan, 1.3 million hectares already under the uh, dry land area implemented. But on irrigated land uh, the areas, it's very, very difficult to implement minimum tillage or zero tillage. That's why we're talking about permanent bed construction. 
soil moisture, soil salinity decreasing, soil organic matter, physical chemical characteristic parameters, also the yield of cotton and winter wheat, which is mainly as a uh, we, we hear that, that, that the main crops, cash crops in the in the, in the, in the Uzbekistan, especially also the, in the central Asia. Conservation agriculture technology have developed local machinery, local technology, which is uh, applicable, and then farmers can use it. A land degradation economical assessment uh, with use of the GIS and uh, remote sensing is needed, of course, now. And especially <coughs> exchange of knowledge, to pass this knowledge to the farmers, especially we're doing the in the last decade, about how to transfer this knowledge to the farmers. That farmers interested, interested in about a thousand hectares in the near the Tashkin province we already implemented. But still a lot of the work, uh, which is, uh, uh, I talked with uh, Alexander Miller, which is we had in uh, Uruguay, a big discussion about how to research transfer to the farmers, much easier. <coughs> how to do it? Of course we need to extension people. We are not extensionists, we are just educators, we are just doing the research with the students, but we need some extension people who can pass uh, and also to, to policy uh, makers and also to do the, this, immediately transfer this knowledge to the, this field. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my understanding is uh, these are research results that are still in the process of being packaged into success stories that will go down to, uh, to uh, the grassroots. So they are still in the process of evolving. The next speaker, my good friend, Richard Thomas. Richard Thomas has been around for a long, long time. <laughs> and he's, he's a man who has refused to grow old. He's an assistant director of the Drylands Ecosystem Program at the um, United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. Richard has over, did he say 20, 30 years, I am increased experience managing and implementing research projects and directing research teams on rural resource management, including soils, water and biodiversity. A significant portion of his work has been on strengthening managerial and institutional capacity through the development of networks of scientists from developed and developing countries. This includes projects in Latin America, Africa and Asia. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Victor. Um, success stories in uh, sustainable land management. We have a compendium now of these success stories from uh, Wolcott. Uh, the missing link in the Wolcott story is a thorough analysis of economics of the system. And I want to emphasize why we are focusing and come back to the title of this session is the dialogue between decision takers and, and scientists. First of all, uh, some of you may not be aware of the, the sort of reason to be for of the, the economics of land degradation initiative. We've heard uh, in this meeting the possible approaches to address this issue. We heard the emotional or what I call the scare story approach. We know that hasn't worked. Uh, you can't equate soil with furry animals and pandas and things like that, so that doesn't gain traction. The second one that we heard about were policies and regulations. There's been marginal success in implementing good policies and regulations. I think we all know if you work in developing countries, there are lots of policy and regulations on the statute books. There is hardly any uh, implementation of those policies on the ground. As a result of an analysis of this sort of failures, it's very clear that we were targeting the wrong audiences. 
You can convince people in the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Irrigation, the Ministry of Water that your technologies are going to save your soils. What they can't do, what they have failed to do, is to convince their own policy makers. Excuse me. <laughs> to allocate enough investment from their national budgets into sustainable land management. That is the main reason why, and this came from the first uh, scientific conference of the UNCCD, one of the recommendations, and it was echoed by several other people, that we need to talk in the same language as the people who decide the allocation of the national budgets. These are people in the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Planning. They are not in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Water and Irrigation. So all our good work has not been properly targeted. And the common language to reach those people is economics. It's dollars. Second point I want to make is we've heard about the need to go beyond the usual uh, provision in services types of economics and to talk about total economic value. No one has actually done a thorough total economic value. Why should we aim for this? Why isn't the food production type analysis good enough? We heard this morning uh, from the International Land Coalition that the value of land in negotiations is still based mainly on food production. They are probably undervaluing land by several fold because we are not considering the other ecosystem services and the value they have. So it's important that we aim for a total economic value to give tools, put them into the hands of people who are negotiating these land deals. If they're only negotiating on the basis of increased productivity, they're undervaluing their, their land, they're underselling the potential of the land, they're underselling the livelihoods, etc. of the people that are living there. So that is why, even though it's a tremendous challenge to move towards total economic valuation, we must make an effort so that the country where foreign direct investment is now occurring at rapid rates and huge amounts of lands are on a much stronger negotiation base. That's why we have to make an effort on that. Now, come back to this uh, session. Why, why case studies? We know that land degradation is a, is a complex process. It's driven by a suite of, not just by physical factors, but social economic factors as well. Often the limitations in the study of this involve not just the technologies, but the institutional, the policy and the knowledge. So we have to think of this in a much more holistic way. When we think about how the causes, the drivers of desertification were analysed, people like uh, Geist and Lomban uh, developed a set of very simple things. They were able to identify a set of basically four proximate drivers and six underlying drivers. That immediately gives us a tool to try and reduce the complexity of land degradation using that sort of framework. Another group, not too far away from here, looked at it in terms of syndromes, different symbols for, for desertification processes. Again, these are tools that help us simplify the complexity of, of the problem. We need case studies that can look at the economics, and we need many of them, so that we can also develop 
the typologies of the economics of land degradation. And just a few case studies is not going to be enough. We need a big investment in lots of different case studies that can cover that range of complexity and we need to come to an agreement on what level of typology, what different typologies we will need to analyze it in the same way that the Eastern Lamban paper where they looked at 132 case studies very nicely broke down this complexity and people need to use that become combining with the economics to get examples of the economics of land degradation under these different conditions because we know it's so very wrong. My last point on the case studies is that in developing countries and even we've heard in developed countries like you know there's a dearth of information and trained capacity to undertake these sorts of studies. There are very few environmental economists out there that are looking at the issue of land degradation. We need to use the case study approach to train and build capacity within the countries, within the regions, to help us develop this type, typological approach to the problems. The other important issue about the capacity building in the countries is that we need to target people who can act as nodes between their scientific communities and their political communities. We need people that sit between the scientists and the key ministries that are involved in taking decisions on the allocation of national budgets. We need to think about whatever approach we take that we try and use it several times for several different purposes. And that's because the environment we're facing is incredibly data and capacity limited. So we need to avoid repeating mistakes we've had in the past. We need to develop people, and as Professor Von Braun said at the beginning, transdisciplinary. We're not very good at training transdisciplinary scientists. We need to use initiatives like the economics of land degradation to help train those transdisciplinary science, scientists in the developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We've been told that there's a compendium of success stories which has been documented in book cuts. So we can assess this. One secret Thomas has shared with us in getting policymakers to accept our strategies is to make sure that we penetrate the Ministry of Planning and Finance. Because they are the ones that develop economic policies for the country. You may also want to add that it's important to also touch base with the legislature. Because they approve the budget at national level. Thomas has advised on the need for us to only take a lot of case studies and then at different uh, uh, within different complexities and apply the topological approach you also emphasize the need for capacity building cutting across different disciplines including the users of technologies that we are proposing thank you Thomas our next speaker is Nina Hegeman, a researcher, a distinguished, she's done a lot of work. <laughs> Areas of expertise and research 
new institutional economics, which is done there, water recycling management institutions, which is trail a lot of blaze in those areas. Currently, she's working on International Water Research Alliance Saxony, a water resource management in hydrologically sensitive regions, specifically the case studies Ukraine. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, today I will talk less about um, water, but um, soil, of course. Um, I broadened the um, range of disciplines here, so I'm neither a soil scientist nor an economist, I'm a political scientist, um, so another different perspective. Um, I would like to start with a comment um, on what I heard so far um, at this conference. Yesterday there was a panel um, where we discussed um, the role of farmers and um, the knowledge of farmers on degradation issues. I think what we have to keep in mind is that, um, of course, we would like to provide farmers um, as many different services as possible and um, to prevent soil degradation. But I think what we have to keep in mind is that farmers are running also a business. And um, what all of you who read the, um, the paper, um, land prices are increasing and also other prices are increasing. For example, prices for um, fertilizers, um, and all of these um, farmers have to take into account. So, um, market plays a crucial role, and the farmer also has social costs, so he has to make a living. But on the other hand, um, as he is um, having a business, the farmer, he knows that soil is his most valuable capital. And what we found out in our interviews was that farmers know very well about their soils. They don't know as much as um, the soil scientists sitting here in this room, but they know what's good for their soils and what's not. And I think this is something um, we have to keep in mind. Um, I would like um, to talk about um, Europe. Um, several years ago, um, in 2008, um, we had a case study um, called Sustainable Agriculture and Soil Conservation. This was supported by the European um, Commission and um, the project was in several different EU member states and the main question here was what impacts farmers decisions on crop selection and farming practices. Now our main findings um, were that it is economic factors, I just mentioned uh, market incentives, but it's on the other hand um, also European policy. So in terms of um, the market, market um, signals, um, we have an increase in prices, what I just said, but we also have a lot of uncertainty. So when looking at the wheat prices over the last years, we see that prices increase sharply and they also decline sharply. So what happens, um, for example, in Germany is that biomass production became a very profitable um, area. Because in Germany, farmers get long-term contracts. They get contracts over 10 to 15 years. So here they have they don't have to face this kind of uncertainty. So of course they produce a lot of biomass, with, which is often uh, maize, and this is prone to some uh, to certain kinds of um, soil degradation, for example erosion or decline in organic matter. So economists um, talk about market failure, where we have degradation that is or externalities that are not internalized. So here at this point, policy comes in and tries um, to regulate. Um, I don't want to go into European agricultural policy um, in depth. I just would like to focus on one or two policies um, where we saw that they are um, successful in fighting soil degradation. And the most prominent here is the Rural Development Programme in Europe. So farmers are paid um, for producing or for environmental friendly production. The advantage of this measure is that it, this is designed at the regional level in Europe and a lot of stakeholders are involved when these kind of measures are developed. And what we can see is that there are, for example, um, in Germany, there are programs on um, unsown crops in maize. So biomass production where we have um, 
where we have crops on the zone and that prevent erosion. And these measures are remunerated by these agri-environmental schemes. And farm farmers apply these kind of measures. And what's interesting here, what we got from our interviews um, in the different case study areas is that, for example, a program that was extensification of grassland was applied by farmers even after the payment stopped, because this payment is only for a certain period of time. So farmers learned, and they learned that this measure has a positive impact on their soils, so they kept applying um, this measure. What's problematic is um, that, I say it again, market prices are rising, and um, what farmers get is re remuneration for applying these measures does not cover the cost anymore. So these measures are not very profitable at the moment. But there are also other uh, measures, for example, tax reduction on innovative technologies. So when farmers buy innovative technologies, for example, um, wheels that prevent soil compaction, they got remunerated, and farmers like these kind of measures. Um, we all know cross-compliance, a subsidy that is paid in the EU and that is based on an um, environmental friendly um, production. Um, member states can implement this kind of policies um, according to, to their needs. The UK is an example where we have a soil protection review plan. Farmers have to set up a plan for all their plots um, and how far they are um, subject to degradation. It is said in the case studies that it's hard to tell how effective these are, but what we know is that farmers get aware of the amount of degradation um, on their plots. And the most important findings from the case studies among Europe was that what is most effective is advice. We have several positive examples where farmers got advice by advisors, um, they took part in projects, and they were really engaged, even though they sometimes have to have to pay for advice, um, they reacted to this, and they were always asking for advice. And we also saw that in cases where um, farm advice was privatized, that there was less advice, of course, because farmers had to pay. Where advice was government funded, farmers were more engaged and they were really interested in what can I do on my soil because, like I said in the beginning, farmers are interested in their soils but they have to know what is especially what is simple and what is um, not so cost um, intense. So coming to the conclusion, of course farmers tend to adopt measures that are economically viable and fit in with their overall management, uh, farm management, but market incentives, yeah, they are very dominant. On the other hand, there are different kinds of policies that can help um, to prevent, to prevent um, soil degradation. And most importantly, advice and information is very crucial. And it helps. It's not that cost intense, but it helps. And farmers are looking for these kind of advice. How do I best um, farm my plots? But for all of these measures, um, financial support is necessary but it will pay off in the medium and long term. And what I liked in the first session is the discussion on data, because this is something um, that was also mentioned in many interviews, that we need data. If we say, well, we're going to support advice, politicians have to argue, why do we increase the payments for advice? And there we have to see, okay, this we have, we have results when having advice, we can reduce soil degradation, and in the end, we will save this amount of money, but we don't have this data at the moment. So this is, this is very important. Data on economic, oh, economic data on soil degradation. How much does it cost when we don't prevent soil degradation, and especially over a longer period of time? So what does it mean in 10 years? How much reduce in yield I will have in 10 years when soil degradation goes on the way it does at the moment? So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ina. Ina has told us that um, farmers in Europe 
should not be relegated, <clears throat> relegated to the background when it comes to knowledge because they have indigenous knowledge. They value the soil. They know the role of soil <clears throat> in agricultural productivity. She identified policy, market, as very crucial in addressing the issue of land degradation. She identified some policies that could be taken as success stories, particularly in rural, the one that concerns rural development, where farmers are paid so much money for employing sustainable land management practices. That approach, you said, is sustainable, but later discovered not to be very profitable. She also told us that where farmers use appropriate technologies, particularly those technologies that reduce <coughs> silly crusting, they get paid for it. She identified soil extension as an area of intervention which farmers have appreciated so much. In some cases, soil extension, advice, and subsidize, and that is what farmers consider as very, very useful. She then advised on the need to have data on the economics of land degradation over a time frame. Thank you. And next speaker, and the last speaker, Wellington. Is it here? Wellington Mulenge, my brother from Kenya. He holds a PhD in Agricultural Economics and works for the Kenyan Agricultural Research Institute. He's a specialist in agricultural policy, research, and analysis. Wellington is an author of numerous publications in agricultural development in Kenya. Over to you, Wellington. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. I'll take a very short time because most of the nice stuff has, has already been repeated. Um, and my case study is uh, uh, on Machakos, um, south. Uh, east of Nairobi, and this is a place where there was a, a, a near ecological disaster in the 1930s uh, during the colonial rule, and the, uh, the ecological disaster was such that uh, the population was increasing, the local people who had been uh, pastoralists um, and hunters started uh, farming, which they didn't understand, and the, this new system of livelihood uh, caused a very serious disaster, and you can see from uh, these hilly sites, uh, uh, we were somewhere near uh, the lower end of, the, of uh, those graphs we were looking at in the morning. So the colonial government, um, came up with a, a solution, and the solution was to uh, make bench terraces. Um, it's a way, it's a, it's a very labor-intensive uh, technology, which um, requires that you, you dig and lift up um, soil upstream, upstream to create uh, bench terraces. Um, so, the interesting uh, thing about this is that uh, we had two approaches. The colonial government used a top-down approach where they actually forced the natives to, to dig the terraces. Um, and 
they didn't like it because it was a neck breaking, uh, a back breaking uh, uh, task, task. And what happened is that they were only able to terrace about 440,000 hectares out of thousands. So after independence, this technology was completely abandoned because it was alien and nobody wanted to touch it. So the problem continued. Um, and this is the kind of uh, thing that you had in the 70s. Uh, the soil became degraded again and then it was a serious <laughs> affair. But the same approach was used again. Um, they identified local institutions uh, like the self-help groups. Um, that is uh, people coming together to assist one another in solving problems. And you can see this group of women. Uh, and that is what I'm calling uh, collective action. Uh, this collective action acted as a subsidy, like the one we were just told by uh, the lady from uh, the European the, the European setup. And they were this was able to, with the coming together they were able to work on these uh, uh, soils, build the terraces and it was actually a success. Um, of course you needed other factors that came into play like uh, coming up with a, a technology mix which you have also been told uh, created success here in Europe. And then, of course, some reasonable government incentives, training and extension. That really assisted so much. And the result is that we had terraces all over. Almost every part of Arab land was uh, terraced. And you can see that there was increased uh, productivity, increased tree cover. Um, and they were able to produce surplus that uh, went to the market and this really assisted in uh, uh, maintenance of the, of the terraces. In fact, if you didn't have the access to market, you, you, it's very expensive to maintain the terraces. So, and we have also seen this in coffee. Uh, coffee also is grown mainly on, the, on, on some of these uh, the, the steep slopes in Kenya and uh, you, have, you need to have very strong bench terraces. The moment coffee prices went down, maintenance of the terraces went down also and then you had very serious erosion in, this, in these places. So uh, what I'm saying is that with proper incentives and using local institutions, you can be able to achieve the benefits of sustainable land management. And a recent study that we carried out in this same area uh, about three years ago, we were able to see that uh, youths in places where there are bench terraces were far much higher than in areas where the structures were either being degraded or absent. Uh, and then you can see that uh, we were able to also what, uh, calculate the economic water productivity. And you can see where you have uh, bench terraces, there is a lot of increase in uh, water, water use, uh, economic water use productivity. So the other problem is that um, if you look at, apart from these on-farm benefits uh, in terms of yield increases, uh, economic water productivity, there are other uh, benefits that are not quantified. And hence, uh, we need research so that farmers can be able to internalize most of these other benefits that they are not uh, able to, to get. So. Uh, in conclusion, um, initial investments in sustainable land management uh, are high and sometimes 
um, beyond the reach of many poor farmers. But working with the community, you can come up with solutions that uh, can take care of some of these problems. And you need uh, community, regional, national and supporting policy, legal and uh, institutional frameworks to support uh, adoption of uh, sustainable land management. And of course you need very strong research, education and extension to come up with solutions. And of course uh, market uh, incentives are good. And targeted investments in sustainable land management pace. That's it. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have to save time so that we can take the next session, which is the way forward. Well, your story is very clear. Success story that's, that has worked. Mobilizing the rural people, particularly the women. So women will take credit for this. They saw the need to effect these corrections in land degradation or else there would have been abject poverty. So they were driven by circumstances to really um, do something about it with the encouragement received by from the government. Question and answers. We just take two so that we can go to the next very, very important session. Yes. Tell us your name, the institution you represent. Um, good afternoon. My name is Christina Seabrook. I'm from FAO. And I have a question for the gentleman. Sorry, I didn't get your name or I can't see your name from Uzbekistan on the conservation agriculture case studies. Um, maybe I missed it, but I was wondering what the adoption rate of conservation agriculture is in Uzbekistan and then whether there's any analysis that you've done what supports the adoption. I mean, it, it seemed you were speaking favorably of conservation agriculture in your country, in your experience. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether there are any conclusions of, on what can support the adoption and um, also whether there has been any economic analysis done because just from experience that we have in some of our projects, especially when you come to look at the economic side of it, for smallholders it can become difficult and there are certain constraints also looking at labour for example. So I was wondering whether you could comment on that. Thank you. Okay, just, just take note. Yes. Next question or comment? All right. The rate of adoption. Yeah. Of CA. Uh, thank you for the question. Of course, it's important that all of the work which has been done as a scientist or educator about the 20 years, it should be adopted. Yeah. The, 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 the issue is, as a success story, is that the farmers is like it, the front and bottom up approach, if you're talking about it. The, uh, in the Tashkin provinces, we, the, we, the farmers use about a thousand hectares. I mean, it's not as big, but the, the, uh, uh, I would say that the farmers are looking for machinery, which is specific <coughs> machinery, which is where uh, bringing from the Brazil, from the Pakistan, etc. But it's not the case. We need the machinery which is will be locally produced. That's why a, uh, this kind of wide adoption is maybe limited. Secondly, we uh, we talking with the policy policy makers, decision makers, and interesting. Sometimes I, I like the, the Thomas approach that uh, we need to talk with the, uh, not with the Minister of Agriculture, of course Minister of Agriculture, first of all, should to approve it and then to go to the Minister of Finance. Because if the Minister of Agriculture not send the message, uh, it's not will really go further. And secondly, for example, when we're talking about uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, etc., etc., the most important people like it, not that we are uh, 
biological improvement of soil, earthworms, it's not as interesting for them. Interesting that's important, which is issue, is a fuel, simple fuel, which is not enough in the campaign, in a, in a, in a, in a field campaign. Even sometimes you'd say, uh, we can buy, buy the fuel, but it's not available. So that's why the fuel consumption, which is, I showed it in my uh, economic uh, uh, analysis, which was done in Uzbekistan, that's about, say, 30% of machinery and fuel. So that's the calm down. But um, you are right, there's a question about, we are looking now for the, uh, the process of the case studies in different regions. It's also to shoot to some students or PhD should have done it because it's the, it's important issue because we we have enough materials to to do the two weeks one month uh, training for farmers thousands of trainers uh, farmers are trained under the FAO project and uh, we working together with the, 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 the Theo Frederick also the Jose Benitez before is retired. Uh, unfortunately, but we're still going on. Adoption is number one now task. We work now in the, in the policy makers uh, level, which is will be adopted, not only one uh, district, but widely in the country. Okay, let me just have the last word. The criteria for success stories. Some of the criteria includes the fact that the Technology must be proven, it must be accessible to farmers, it must be cost effective, and must have must be sustainable and must have potential for adaptability and upscaling. With this, I come to the end of my chairmanship. We will put our hands together again for the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schule. Uh, last session, um, I'd like to pass on the microphone to Stefan Schmitz, who will share and introduce his distinguished panel. I, I know the, the day has gone by. Um, the buses will not leave without us to the food. <laughs> You actually can spend 50 minutes, but you will not. Um, ELD is exhausting, isn't it? Um, please, um, uh, let's very much focus on this last session. I think uh, what's up in the air is really, including a few other big issues, the role between what's the role of government and ELD, what role of farmers, and um, uh, what role for markets? Uh, I think these are very big issues. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. The last, uh, the last uh, panel, the last session of uh, this um, after, uh, afternoon session in general, it's on the way forward for policy actions and sustainable land uh, management. May I ask the four distinguished uh, delegates to come to, uh, to the floor? Um, Yes. So we have this evening Mr. Victor Kacha, Mr. Maldidio Yasse, Mr. Alexander Müller, and Mr. Michael Obersteiner. Um, I will introduce uh, the uh, distinguished delegates uh, later. First, um, we start with um, uh, Victor Kacha. Luke is the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Before taking up his position as UNCCD Executive Secretary, Mr. Nakacha served as Minister of Environment, Housing and Urban Development of Benin from 1999 to 2005. Mr. Nakacha is an architect by profession. He was also the successful CEO of a consultancy firm. He graduated uh, from Harvard University and uh, was with the World Bank uh, Training Institute. Luke Nakacha, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much for such kind introduction. Uh, good uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it's a pleasure to step in at this stage and maybe flat a couple of points. Uh, we, we need to bring uh, the, the, the narrative about degradation and restoration to fit into the macroeconomics. If we do not do that, we will still be talking about the doom and gloom in two other decades. Uh, the doom and gloom have not really helped, and I think Richard Thomas uh, said it, help to uh, push for sustainable land uses and including uh, increasing investment uh, for poverty alleviation, food security, and beyond water security and avoiding degradation, uh, forest degradation. Uh, that's one point. The second point is that degradation is often driven by or often the consequences of uh, uh, misplaced policies, incentives, and investment in developed and in developing countries. I have seen it in both ends. So what does it mean? So that if we talk about avoiding degradation and we do not really provide element for government, for stakeholders, for private sectors to transition from the type of misplaced investment and policies towards those that will uh, address the sustainable uh, use of the land uh, it's not just about agriculture, though I, I like very much my friend uh, uh, Alexander Muller, but he will, <laughs> he's taking the word away from me. But it's not just about agriculture. If we just think about agriculture, then we, we, we are losing uh, the, the, the holistic imperative that we have of addressing uh, uh, soil functions. And thirdly, uh, the, international, the intergovernment or the international community is likely to debate on what will happen after 2015, the MDGs. And I would like, I would like to invite you to read uh, uh, an assessment we, we, we actually made together with UNDP regarding the implementation of the MDGs in the dryland, just to take drylands. And you will see how, for instance, uh, uh, child mortality, uh, uh, women uh, illiteracy, are correlated by degradation. This is what not really well known when we set the target of the MDGs. And we likely or we should make sure that as we discuss the uh, post-2015 agenda that we, we really substantiate what I think we all believe here and I'm, I'm afraid I'm speaking to those who know about the discourse who are in fact know more than I do about the, the discourse that, that we should make the case and take it to those who are not here, ministers of planning and finance, and, and get them to understand that soil security is a prerequisite of human security. Uh, you take it from poverty alleviation, for food security, for water availability and quality, and beyond climate, vulnerability to climate change, especially in rural areas. Uh, so how do we make that case? I like very much the idea of total value of, of land. Uh, and the idea of total value of land is certainly what will bring ammunition to ministers across the spectrum of the cabinet, but starting from ministers who do not have what it takes to discuss with the Minister of, of Finance. I remember asking the Minister of Finance of my country, how much do you need or do you use to generate 1% of GDP growth? And he looked at me and said, how can this be of interest for the Minister of Environment? I said, well, what you do not know is that the ecosystem functions are much more macroeconomic than you can ever be. Now, just give me a, a, a figure. And it happens that the figure he has, 1% of that figure invested to address a specific aspect of pollution in my country will, will reduce the impact uh, of that pollution, who, who actually is costing 0.5 uh, point of GDP in my country. And as we put the data and the monitoring mechanism on the table, and I told him, I have the data, we are monitoring the data every month. I will bring you the, 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 money, the tracking of change every quarter. If in four consecutive quarters, the trends are not good, cut the budget. He became much more supportive than I can ever be in supporting the investment in, in, the, in the contest and triple the budget in three years. Those are the type of ammunition we need to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Uh
Thank you, Natasha, for these very clear, clear cut uh, words. We are now back in the political arena, the debate. Now we start to link the research question with the political debate. Uh, excellent. We continue on this way. The next, uh, next presenter, next uh, speaker here is Mario Dio Agnese. He's director of the Secretariat of the International Land Coalition, a global independent alliance of intergovernmental and civil society organization established to promote secure access to land for the poor and improve land governance in general. Uh, prior to joining the International uh, Land, Coalition, uh, Land Coalition, Dr. Nias has served as research director with the French Institute for Development uh, Research. Dr. Nias is geographer and environmental scientist by training and is a citizen of Senegal. Dr. Nias, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this morning I had the opportunity to share my perspective on the subject. Uh, so I think I will just probably give additional reflections on the on the economics of, uh, of uh, which I did not discuss uh, this morning. I think when I try to link the discussion this afternoon with what I tried to convey this morning is probably to invite economists to reflect on the, the new context of, of, of soils uh, and, and land in general. What I've tried to explain is that we have reached a point where land being in short supply and food security being of a national security issue, many countries really are ready to pay any price, any price, to, uh, uh, to, to, to ensure their food security. Uh, so I don't know how do you integrate that in, in, the, in, the, in this economic analysis. Like for example, if a country is investing in, for example, having the weapons needed to protect itself, how much is acceptable financially? I think that this is, in fact, the terms in which the debate is being posed now. If you see, for example, a country like uh, Qatar, we, we were here last week, I was asking myself, why this country, so rich, is so concerned about food security? But what they say is that in 1941, they lost one third of their population due to famine. I say that if you ask the question why China is so uh, interested in the subject, they will refer you to the Cultural Revolution in which they lost 3, 30 million people. So for these countries, it's just trauma. Not experience again this type of thing. They are ready to pay almost any price in order to maintain their soil fertile in order to protect themselves and not to depend on an unpredictable international market. To me, I think that that dimension needs to be taken into account. The other implication, I think I see it myself, in fact, as an opportunity, in fact. Many countries were resisting putting money <coughs> in for protecting their soil because they said that we can go out and buy if it generates for them enough financial resources elsewhere. But when we arrive in a context where every country has to protect itself, maybe there are new opportunities for promoting the sustainable land management in a country where you can demonstrate that this can make a difference, like the case of Majakos in, 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 in Kenya, for example. It makes a good sense for a country to invest more in sustainable, like uh, uh, which was contrary land than in the past. I think that this is, to me, I think that the critical element. The third point, the second point probably I would like to mention just to invite also economists not to be too reductionist, because we at the International Land Coalition, we say that we consider that land, yes, it is for productive, it is also for the environment, for, but for people, land is much more than that. It is a cultural issue, it is an identity, it is a dignity. If you put a value that ignores those aspects, you are invite almost government to send, to leave, to give away the, the land by, while ignore, ignoring those aspects. So these are extremely important. I have seen in many cases, therefore, uh, even the compensation package to the, comp to the population were just made on the basis of what, how much money this population was used to take out of the land, ignoring all the other elements. And last week when I come from, from Senegal, 
We went for them, the government had given land to a private company. The main concern of the population is that this land being given away is a burial ground for their ancestors. So those values are so important, and I think that how these are challenging aspects that for economists to take into moderation. There are many other issues we can discuss, but I think I wanted to put on the table those two issues which I think are relevant to the discussion we are having this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, clear words again. Don't be too reductionist. Clear play to the economists. Very interesting. Next uh, speaker, um, Alexander Müller. He's Assistant Director General um, at the FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United uh, Nations. Uh, and there he's heading uh, the Natural Resource Management and Environmental uh, Department. Um, from 2001 to 2005, he was State Secretary of the German Federal Ministry of Consumer Protection, Food and Agriculture. Um, before that, he was a member of German Parliament and chaired the caucus of the Green, Green Party. Uh, Mr. Miller holds a Master Degree on Social Sciences, focusing on Sociology and Political Sciences from the University of Marburg in Germany. Alexander, it's yours. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Before presenting a process which I think could be used to also find or contribute to a solution how we can better put sustainable land management on the uh, political agenda, I would like to make reference to both speakers. Yes, look, it's not only about agriculture, but without agriculture we will not achieve it. So agriculture has to be part of it, but it's not everything. And therefore, we have to be in your coalition. And with regard to Madio Dio, I personally think since 2007-2008 a lot of things have changed since the high food prices. Some countries now have at least the perception that even with all money in the world you cannot buy enough food when it comes to a crisis because there are export restrictions and uh, countries are competing with each other and therefore they do not really trust the market. The, the reaction is we have to ensure our food security. It's, it's like with weapons, they don't want to see and I use your example, food being used as a weapon in the markets, and therefore they are ready to invest a lot of money in order to at least have a basic food security. And this has changed a lot in, in the international arena. And that's the reason, now I'm coming back to, to my presentation, why I believe that we have to also consider which kind of process we are setting up. I've learned in the UN without process there's no progress. But even with the process, you do not really know if there is progress. But without this process, you won't get nowhere. And therefore, I would like to present the process we have used to get an agreement on our guidelines, voluntary by nature, on responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests. In the beginning, there was a lot of resistance before we came to the final agreement in the Committee on Food Security. A lot of people said, you don't have the competence, we don't want it, it's a national issue. But over three years, we really kick-started a process where in the end we achieved the first global soft law instrument on tenure, which we, and that's important, negotiated not only with governments, but with a broad participation of civil society and private sector. The problems were well known everywhere. There was an increased competition, governing institutions have not adapted to a growing intensity of competition, and therefore we've been in a situation where Research could give us a lot of guidance what has to be done, but research was decoupled from policies. FAO has done a lot of work together with the World Bank and countries to implement here and their project. But there was no agreement on what means good governance. And therefore we started, beginning with research, a process which I will outline very in the next two minutes. We started with consultations on all continents where we ask people to inform us what are the real problems in your region with regard to land tenure. And of course this was not so very different than what research did tell us, but we had a different view because we invited governments, civil society, private <coughs> sector, academia, and everybody who had something to say with regard to land tenure. And what we did is we built up a global consensus, a process is needed. We did at a private sector meeting in the UK, I was not so happy with the private sector meeting because only a few companies showed up. 
We had a special meeting with civil society in Asia, with uh, civil society in Latin America, La Via Campesina, with a very strong voice. Also in Italy, with civil society, and in with Africa. So they had their own fora where they could organize themselves, and as a result, we had more than 1,000 people from 133 countries gathering in 15 meetings, and they published a report on every meeting where they agreed these are the challenges. And we used this for this assessment from the consultations to start drafting a zero draft of our voluntary guidelines, had a very broad e-consultation, and ended up in a first draft, which was negotiated by 98 countries, civil society and private sector. And this brought the breakthrough. So after three years of preparatory negotiations, countries agreed, yes, there's a problem which we could solve with voluntary negotiations. The, the first meeting we had in FAO end of 2006, there was a lot of resistance from countries. Why do you want to deal with it? It's a question of never national sovereignty. FAO can never develop a legally binding agreement. We didn't aim for it. In the beginning, we had water in it. A lot of resistance, water is transboundary, don't touch it. A lot of people said we have cultural differences with access to land, but we try to cover it all. And therefore, my main message here is if we want to go from this global soil meet and from this absolutely important discussion on economics of land degradation to changing the behavior, we have to set up a process where we have to bring all different stakeholders together. I've learned today and also yesterday that there's still a big difference between different uh, scientific uh, research uh, results. But let's forget the small differences. Let's look at the big picture of how to improve sustainable land management, again, far beyond agriculture. And this not only have a Eurocentric uh, perception of it. There are other continents and other cultures who have a lot to contribute to it. And therefore, and I will not go into what I have additionally prepared, otherwise it would be long. Let's, uh, too long. Let's look at a process where Global Soil Week and everybody who is interested could contribute to designing a process where in the end you could get an agreement. I personally think it will be voluntary because uh, I don't see how we can do it in a different way on sustainable land management where we avoid further land degradation. That's my contribution and I forget the rest of my slides. <laughs> Big applause. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, let's look at the big picture and bring stakeholders together and look towards some kind of voluntary agreements uh, on sustainable land management. Thank you very much. Now, last speaker for uh, last speaker tonight is uh, uh, Michael uh, Obersteiner. He is a leader of the Ecosystem Services and Management Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Luxembourg, Austria. His background includes the fields of global terrestrial ecosystems and economics, having completed graduate studies both in Austria uh, and, uh, and abroad. Dr. Obersteiner's research experience stretches from plant physiology and biophysical modeling in the areas of ecosystems, forestry and agriculture, to environmental economics, <coughs> bioenergy engineering and climate change sciences. Hi, Obersteiner. Thank you very much. In, in German we have this saying, the last one is beaten by the dog, so I'm uh, the most uh, unfavorable person in the room. Uh, we also have the saying that, uh, you know, uh, I'm building on, on the shoulders of, uh, of giants and uh, you see them here in the previous speakers. So there's actually not a lot uh, left for me, but I still want to focus my talk on uh, the dialogue between decision makers and, and scientists and uh, I'm very much involved in the boundary between science and, and policy making in the sense of uh, making policy impact assessments where we actually accompany policy processes uh, with mostly economic analysis which also has a, a biophysical grounding but more lately uh, we are also engaging in, in strategic policy consultancy uh, for governmental organizations and one example is uh, the Norwegian International Climate, Initi Climate and Forest Initiatives. This is for those who, you, who don't know is uh, the five billions the Norwegian government uh, gave out in order to save the forests and one of the interesting things uh, for, for those five billions is actually it's much harder to, to earn money than actually to spend it wisely and, and, and they have the, the, the 
the trouble to really spend it wisely because it's a lot of money that you need to deploy it very quickly. And so uh, I want to share some of the few insights from that process on, 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 on the key issues advising the Norwegian government on where to focus on. But let me first uh, uh, depart where uh, Professor Ratan uh, Lahr was, uh, was stopping. He basically said, you know, that, that the biophysical degradations of, uh, of the soil. But we actually, uh, uh, we have serious degradation in the system how we govern our soils. And this is, some, this is an interesting subject we actually so, should study more. And, uh, and we also have many, many failures. You know, you, you mentioned the, the, the many initiatives on soils, which uh, many of them failed, and, or at least were not as successful as many other things. So, for example, the saving of the forests, which really got its avenue into the UNFCCC. And we need to understand why that happened. Is it the complexity of the issue as such, or is it, are there other reasons? Um, what we discussed a lot today was uh, on the issue of the total cost or total benefit of, uh, of the soil. Uh, and, uh, and everyone was looking at the economists and those guys can actually do it. Uh, let's, and this is what uh, economists like to do most, let's assume uh, we can do this. But what in addition do we need to do to make this a success story? Because if we just come out with the big number, you know, soils are worth that much, uh, this will not do the job. And the first issue uh, was actually mentioned already uh, by, by Luc, is, is actually to really put it into uh, a larger context, a macroeconomic uh, and even a societal context. And one way to do it is, is actually to, to write glossy reports, such as uh, the, the, the ELD will actually be one of those glossy reports. Uh, but what, we, what, what one needs to do in addition is actually to have it associated with some kind of uh, leading figure that actually carries the message around, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, a Bill Clinton, a Klaus Döpfer, who actually <laughs> leads it uh, into, into the policy arena and actually really fights for it uh, proactively. Uh, the other thing is, is by producing such a report, uh, you actually establish networks and, and, and spread the word and uh, you build relationship capital and especially for soils it's such a cross-sectorial <coughs> issue that you, you, and this makes it also very difficult and is probably the reason why things were not so successful in the past. You need to talk to so many ministries uh, and uh, UN agencies and so forth and they are busy with their own thing. So it's actually very difficult to diffuse those things uh, so easy and, and one needs to have very clear strategies on how to do this. And this is also a question of, uh, of investment on how to, to, to do this. Um, the other thing I think uh, for the, the, the report is, and, and probably for the overall process is, we have the, the, the three conventions. Mm -hmm. And the three conventions live their own life, but they would together, they would be much stronger. And we were not so successful uh, to bring the three conventions really together and say something on the issue of land. Mm -hmm. And uh, you actually have uh, uh, real trade-offs and, for example, take again the, 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 the saving of the forests. If you save the forest, you actually increase the pressure on the dry land uh, in order to produce the same amount of, uh, of, uh, of food. So you, here you have issues that where you actually introduce an additional driver that puts more pressure on, on the dry land. And those issues uh, one needs to, to address together. And this is also one of the the ways where science can come in, and good science can come in and actually unearth those problems and bring it into the debate such uh, that the three conventions can go together. There are many, many, many other issues uh, associated with this. Um, one thing, uh, the overall environmental community was still not very good, is to really bring uh, sustainable land management into the development agenda. And we have this great opportunity that uh, many business leaders, but also many political leaders, like green growth, or it has other forms of uh, uh, other names. And, and I think this is a real opportunity for us uh, who sit in this room, but for, for many others, uh, to actually take that momentum on and try to piggyback a little bit on it. Uh, or at least, uh, 
have a, a plan B on how to really have sustainable land management mainstream in economic planning. And this is again one issue we science scientists can, can offer. We can offer tools to actually bring uh, the, the, the analysis and the numbers into economic planning. And when you travel around in many countries, Brazil, Indonesia, all the, 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 the big countries, there's actually a lot of willingness to do so. Um, the next issue I want, uh, would like to talk about, and I'm looking at the clock, and becoming increasingly unpopular. Is the governance issue, and we can talk forever on this. One issue is, and I, I didn't hear this too much, is really law enforcement. And when you look at the success story of Brazil, Again, fighting deforestation, which was by the Nature Journal was called the biggest success story of the 20th century, which saved a lot of, uh, of, of earth also, uh, of soil. Uh, this is a very powerful weapon, and even very much appreciated by the business sector. When we talk about the business sector, there's also an, an opportunity uh, currently up, up and running, and this is the Consumer Goods Forum. So this is the... the uh, all of the big uh, uh, retail uh, companies, which is about 7% of global GDP, which they are turning over, so that they have real power. And they are very interested to clean up uh, their, their commodity chains. And uh, science can come in with life cycle analysis and, uh, and many other things to really help on those, uh, on those issues. And things are already going forward. And, and, uh, uh, but it's, it's mainly on the carbon issues and so forth. The, the soil sustainability issue is not really mainstream there. And this is definitely an opportunity and one should take that opportunity aggressively. And finally, and I, I will uh, uh, stop on that one, we really need to have a better evidence base on the things we do. We as scientists, but also the practitioners, we need to have the evidence base, not only to show it to the policy makers, but also to, to, for learning for ourselves. Uh, this is very important. And uh, I will stop there. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for a better evidence base. Uh, Numbers are, are key, but numbers are not everything. And thank you here for, for showing us and pointing us to the interlinkages um, uh, between the various uh, conventions. Uh, well, um, before we come to an end, it's uh, seven minutes past seven. We have a few minutes left in case you have any burning questions, but only burning questions, please. And please keep them short. I don't want to kill the debate, but it was just to encourage you to be to reflect on keeping it very short. Yes? Well, I actually wanted to talk about process. The gentleman with process. Oh, yeah. but can I make a few remarks? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, encourage uh, to think about it, sleep at night, and come back tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, two closing statements in mind. I will not do any substantive statement. Uh, if there was no reaction from the audience at this stage, uh, could I make those and then hand back to you, and maybe then the panel reflects a bit also on process forward. Um, we have invited, um, and that's an open meeting for tomorrow at uh, 1.30 in the Copenhagen room here, to discuss uh, the way forward in terms of the ERD initiative, the practical steps, forming the research teams country by country, and there are already some uh, uh, in the making, and uh, some are in the room, and some are roaming around in some other sessions. So uh, uh, please uh, come to this one hour only meeting uh, that is uh, tomorrow at uh, 1.30 here uh, somewhere next door. The room is called Copenhagen. Alicia, is that somewhere here in the... Yes. Uh, okay. 
Secondly, there are other actions uh, uh, planned, and I wanted to suggest, Mark, that you make a few remarks, uh, yeah. just a few sentences. Please, I will come up yes. and, and take the mic, uh, uh, because, um, um, uh, gentlemen, you are part of process. And many of you are receiving end of what we are doing, uh, but we also want you to be part of process. So, Mark, say a few words. Um, yeah, thanks for bearing with us so long and we would very much like you to bear with us for a longer time in the future process as well. So I'm very briefly give you an overview about what is in our books for the next, say, half a year or so. We will go ahead and have a capacity building workshop in Rwanda focusing on the Eastern African region um, on valuation of land and land degradation. with participants from about 15 countries from the Eastern, East African region, second week of December. Something which is maybe more of interest for you now because it's still open is the second scientific conference of the UNCCD. This is a key event for us because it's focusing on economics of land degradation. And we think that this, uh, we, this is a place where ELD will be very present and will make the best of it bring our working group um, participants in there and make it one of our, say, key events there. Um, the next event would be also focusing maybe about uh, a UNCCD event, that's the CRIC, the um, Conference on Review of Implementation. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm still... Thank you. And uh, we are negotiating a business conference there because we want to involve the private sector in our, in our future activities. We are preparing for um, a short interim report um, to declare, to explain our activities. And that will be out in the beginning of early summer next year, presented in Korea with the help of our partners from Korea there. Yeah, and then it's almost the next global soul week already, so no, it's, um, there's a lot on our plate there to come in the next year, and we'd be happy to work with you in this process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, based on these two closing remarks, any, any question from your side? That is not the case. There are any final remark from your side? Is with regard to the ELD process. Well, I, I have just one. Uh, I'm really pleased to to hear that we have a kind of interim report by uh, April, June, uh, which will be used for also communication. Uh, when we, we look at all the dynamics ongoing, including discussions in, in New York on the post-2015 agenda and the SDGs, we need the ELD by yesterday. Uh, so, uh, the, the sooner we, we have that internal report with some uh, early information and messages, it will be key uh, the, to use it uh, in, the, in the discussion forward. But the second point in the same vein is that we need as much as ELD country studies as possible. Because that's where it will be used and useful. When you do that in, in, in Nigeria, in, uh, in Uzbekistan, and, and you name them, you are actually empowering both investors, uh, government, to transition towards uh, improved policies and increasing uh, or building conducive uh, uh, environment to increase investment towards avoiding degradation and uh, 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 increasing restoration by also mapping potential for restoration uh, and cost of uh, action versus inaction. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vic. Alexander. You want to Thanks a lot. With regards to process, I think we have to talk about processes because there are so many processes going on, interlinked or not interlinked. And what we have to ensure that we have a point where these different activities are going to meet. And uh, I would like to thank Luc for having mentioned the post 2015 development agenda because this is the next big elephant in the room. All the activities we are talking about will only make sense if we can get a reference within the discussion on the post-2015 development agenda. And land degradation has to be seen as a barrier to development, or the other way around, sustainable agriculture. Now I'm coming back to my own little box, 
has to be seen as an issue which supports development. And therefore we have to find a way to link things together. And one of my biggest concerns is related to the climate change negotiations. We are trying since three or four years to get the question of food security into the climate change negotiations.